Adrian. Uh, Adriana is here as part of a faculty exchange program uh, called UKNN. She's been here for past few months and is here for a few more weeks. Um, she specializes in the field of urban environmental planning and political ecology. Uh, just a little bit more about her. She was trained as an urban planner in Argentina, her native country, and she has specialized in the fields of urban environmental planning and political ecology. She has 30 years of experience, international experience of research and consulting work in over 20 countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Both as an academic and practitioner, her work focuses on the interface between development and environmental concerns in the urban context of the Global South, and most specifically on fostering transforming transformative links between environmental justice and urban sustainability and resilience. Uh, she is going to take us through a few case studies. Her talk is entitled Taming Cities or Repolitizing the Urban Policy. Uh, and so without much ado, uh, we are very glad to have you, Adriana, and all yours. I don't know if I can have the thingy to, oh. to control them. Is it there? Somewhere there. Sorry. Okay, good evening to all. That's no, uh, okay. It is? Yeah? It is, okay. It's on? It's on? Yeah, yeah okay. okay. Okay, too many too many things, and I'm not a very technical person, but uh, oh, here we are. Okay. So um, I was saying, well, a pleasure again. I'm I'm an old friend of um, IIHS, and and every single time is a is a, a pleasure to be here. It's raise the volume. What do I, how do I do that? They will. Okay. I do as well. Shout a bit. <laughs> I feel okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so what? Um, so I was saying, it's a pleasure to be here, and, um, and I really jumped at the invitation when uh, the guy said, would you have a chat to kick off uh, the discussion that we're going to have because of this um, uh, urban policy dialogue that is going to start uh, tomorrow and take over a place over the next two days? I thought, well, yeah, why not? So what I want to share with you are um, some ideas, some reflections, some things that annoy me, worry me, uh, some um, some preoccupations um, and also some ways of working, some things that I think might have legs to help us make sense of uh, what do we talk about when we talk about urban policy, uh, what seems to be productive uh, in terms of approaching urban policy, whether we are approaching urban policy as urban analysts, as policy makers, implementators, whatever the hat you take. And over my life, I have been changing those hats. So I share my sympathy with, with all those positions. So the first thing perhaps to say, if this yeah, work, is this is quite, there is no doubt that this is quite an interesting time, no, in terms of policy, urban policy. I think that, you know, I have worked in the field for the last uh, 30 years. and. And I think that urban policy is gaining clearly a new status. And that status, to a large extent, has to do with the fact, you know, with this recognition that somehow not just change in cities, but change in development, the direction of any change in development, and particularly in terms of sustainable development, is very, very clearly linked and closely linked with the future of, uh, of what we do in cities. Um, now, this celebration of, you know, of urban policy as, uh, as a key locus for a strategic change that has impacts beyond uh, the city is, um, is an important one, but it's also a very challenging one because it comes at a time in which cities are not only described as being the place where we are going to uh, win or lose a sustainability battle, but also cities are the sites where we can see clearly uh, that four very important uh, assumptions, very uh, important certainties that characterize the uh, making of policy throughout the 20th century are crumbling down. And I'm talking about the idea that energy in, is uh, inexpensive, clearly gone, climate is constant, few people would, no, would agree with that. Uh, the idea that safe drinking water is to be found everywhere and in a nutshell, also the idea that, oh, this is not 
working? Yeah. Am I going in the wrong direction? You want to? And more importantly, the idea that nature is robust enough. So what we are facing as well is this idea that, in fact, urban policy is somehow embedded into this imperative of having to do something, having to do something about this idea of the impacts that cities are having uh, at planetary scale. And this is, I'm going in the reverse, okay, losing all these assumptions, yeah, and the uncertainties that we have to deal with. Now, this was, th let's take this as a short preamble, but I want to put a few contentions before exploring some specific cases. Uh, and the first contention is something that was present in the brief abstract put forward for this talk. And it has to do with the idea that, in my view, there is some value in looking at policies, not in a conventional way, but treating them as what I call taming strategies. In a way, you know, I think that in every case, you know, a policy is, by definition, um, a means to domesticate, change, control, discipline, something. And I think that what is really interesting uh, and important is to interrogate policies for what is that they're trying to tame. So uh, what this idea of what is to be tamed, are we talking about taming capitalist urbanization, nature, people's behavior, uh, uh, people's agency, uh, informality, what is that we are talking that needs to be tamed? The second important question, which I think also is quite interesting, is to think about whether the notion that there is something that needs to be tamed, or the untamability of the city, is perceived as something positive or negative. And I said this because we will find that certain generation of policies are in fact, yeah, certain narratives, are in fact celebrate this idea of the untamability, while others are fully engaged with this idea of disciplining, controlling, um, uh, regulating, and so on. So if I were to use those ideas, which I will apply uh, throughout some examples, I think that um, in, in a broad brush way, we could look, we could identify at least four mainstream narratives, yeah? mainstream narratives in urban policy, in contemporary urban policy that coexist, but with very different interpretations, with very different contentions about what is to be tamed, yeah? what type of change is desirable. And I insist on this idea of trying to interrogate what is to be tamed, why it is to be tamed, what is societal, and so on, because one of the things that frustrates me the most is the fact that I think that a lot of the discussions that we have on policy are very quiet about the axiology, yeah? the set of values that underpin those policies. So we need to really bring, you know, to interrogate policies for what they say explicitly and for what they don't, but they try to do. Now, back to this idea of the mainstream narratives. There could be many more. I'm just uh, uh, working with some that are quite contrasting. On the one hand, clearly, we, we can find the idea of uh, urban policies that are talking directly to some form of inclusive urbanism. And in this case, we could say that what is being tamed is the idea of um, taming processes of particularly maldistribution. Yeah? This is a typical, um, uh, if you wish, argument or narrative of housing policies, land policies, service policies, and so on. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the idea of inclusive urbanism and policies that talk to inclusive urbanism is a bit, is becoming increasingly less popular, less fashionable, and so on. And this is quite problematic. And of course, you know, we know why. It, this has a lot to do as well with the role of the state as the guarantor of a, some form of a redistribution and guaranteed entitlements. Uh, perhaps less popular in terms of being translated into actual policies is the idea of engaging explicitly with the idea of splintering urbanism. And I'm talking here about policies less, but some interesting examples exist, that are engaged or concerned with the idea of taming the emergence of urban apartheid getting down into the throw of inequality, yeah? of not just poverty, but inequality. This is something, again, more rare, but we find interesting examples. A third interesting generation has to do with that of what I would call incremental urbanism, policies that believe, in fact, that uh, cities and everyday practices don't necessarily need to be tamed, but need to be supported, need to be uh, agglutinated, yeah? need to be uh, incrementally built. 
Um, and so this is quite interesting because it, this is a, a clear example in which we find uh, policies that are seeing the untamability of the everyday not as something negative but as something positive, as the departing point up, uh, from which policy should be built. Uh, examples of this, I'm not going to talk about that, but I have looked uh, quite in detail at examples, for instance, of co-production of services, uh, uh, water, sanitation, food production, and so on. And these are clearly examples where what you can see is policies that are trying to open up further uh, cracks to bring to life, to make work at scale in everyday uh, practices that make the city. Now, what I'm going to talk about today particularly is about the fourth type, the fourth uh, narrative that concerns with the idea of green and smart urbanism. Yeah? And here, the key narrative is this idea that we need to tame nature and uh, the metabolism of cities, yeah? how cities in, uh, uh, process uh, uh, nature. This is something that has become, a, has uh, this notion of taming nature the notions of green and, and smart urbanism as a narrative that supports policy and urban policy has had a, a tremendously rapid career and a very worrying career as well, I would say, yeah, in the sense that this presents itself as a new imperative. So although I have been, an, I am an environmentalist, I'm very concerned with the way in which an environmental argument is taking prominence within urban policy debates. So let me explain a bit more on why. I keep on going on the wrong direction. This idea of this generation of policies and narratives that are presenting the environmental imperative yeah, as, um, as uh, the conditions that need to reorganize the way in which we make sense of urban policy, the way in which prioritize what type of direction we should pursue through policy, is very much also articulated to the idea of the reordering the urban Anthropocene. Yeah? And, and you know the story. Yeah? So we're entering the urban Anthropocene, a moment in history where human activity, not any type of human activity, but urban-based human activity is recognized as being changing, yeah? as having a planetary impact. Now, um, of course, what we can see in this argument is a very global diagnosis. Yeah. The diagnosis is global, the imperative is... So we get into the city, but from a global imperative. Whether this global imperative is very much uh, connected with the crumbling down of some form of post-Second World War uh, architecture and governance architecture, um, or all the whole list of pervasive you know, pressures and environmental pressures that I'm listing there. Yeah, these are narratives that are very, very much ingrained in the legitimization of um, uh, this idea of reordering the urban Anthropocene. Interestingly enough, from the same conception, we also see this idea of a polycrisis. Yeah? So there are many coming also from an environmental perspective that are saying, well, but perhaps here what we can see is also an opportunity for decentering policy, for rethinking urban policies as a means to tackle this polycrisis, which goes completely against this idea of uh, conceiving urban policies for one word. I keep on going down. Now, a further concession has to do, uh, contention, sorry, has to do with the locus of urban policy. Yeah? If we are talking on the one hand that the idea that urban policy should be, should be, seek, uh, should be seeking some form of sustainable transitions, um, I would argue that that concern, the locus of that concern, is not so much with the city per se, but what I call the city to be. Or what you could call peri-urban areas, more precisely perhaps the peri-urban interface. This terrain where what is rural, what is urban becomes very blur, yeah? and where you know, the city as we know it is not necessarily uh, clearly recognizable. Why do I say that? Well, a number of reasons. Uh, one very important one is to notice, we cannot ignore the fact that when we talk about the, uh, uh, the urban demographic shift, that we are undergoing, we are not precisely undergoing 
an urbanization shift, that we are going, we are undergoing a poly urbanization shift. Interestingly, the most conservative forecasts show that approximately, or at least 45% of the, in this case, 1.4 billion people that, is, that are going to join <coughs> the world's urban population by 2020 are going to be living not in cities, but in peri-urbanizing areas. And what is interesting is that when we look in detail at peri-urbanizing areas, peri-urbanizing areas are not a stage, yeah? are, not, are not showing a stage towards the full consolidation of becoming urban. Peri-urbanizing areas present another form of urban transition. Um, this different form of urban transition shows us, for instance, a, a different phase, a phase in which cities might develop without network infrastructure. So we need to start thinking about that. In how do we support urban life without network infrastructure? How does that work? Yeah? Uh, with systems that don't resemble anything of the type of infrastructure development that we have been developing for years. More importantly, we also see, uh, and I also see this um, city to be as the site of a splintering and a splinter urbanisms. This is to say, this is not just the site where the poor live, but this is very much the site, territories which are highly contested, where we see subsistence farmers, abattoirs, uh, informal settlers, industrial entrepreneurs, middle and upper class commuters, all living in the same territory, but of course with very different conceptions, very different claims, very different demands and practices as to what that territory should be. Um, what is also interesting to see is that, of course, in the past, peri-urban areas have featured in urban policy, but in a very different way. Peri-urban areas, if we look back even in the last 20 years, 30 years, we will see that they were typically treated as the backyard of the city. Yeah? Where, where were you to place all the unwanted activities or functions that were to support urban life typically in the peri-urban areas? Um, a second uh, uh, typical uh, treatment was the idea of treating these areas as a buffer zone, where you could be uh, 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 holding land uh, for future uh, expansion and so on, and of course using that land, releasing that for relocations, uh, uh, following evictions, uh, 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 large housing project, uh, programs, etc., etc. So you know all, all these ways in which the city to be has been treated, but the difference is that now instead of seeing that more residual approach towards those areas, what we see is that not only they are becoming the locus of urban policy, but they are also being valued and appraised in a completely different light. Very urban areas are being increasingly seen as a depository of environmental services and natural capital. And this is changing completely the narratives as what are we supposed to do then in terms of urban policy? What is the desirable change in, in these areas? In that sense, I would argue as well that peri-urban areas, when looked closely, are one of the most prolific um, spheres um, and scenes of experimentation with the notion of sustainable urban transitions. Of course, urban policy is still active in urban, in inner uh, core uh, areas, but we see much less innovation. Yeah? The speed of innovation, the speed of change, the level of contested ideas that work in these environments is huge, and therefore there is quite a lot uh, to, to understand from it. Um, now, one could say, well, why perhaps good news that we are going beyond the built-up city, we are trying to understand uh, cities uh, as something far more complex, as systems that, uh, that have uh, uh, to do with much more than just uh, their physical form. However, when we look at the type of um, debates or ways in which policy in peri-urban areas, in this peri-urban interface, um, are being shaped, I would argue that there are two issues that are quite uh, perhaps um, of concern. One is that the scale at which we approach, or urban policy typically seems to approach change in this peri-urban context, seems to be um, too micro to fully re-embed urban policy into regional policies. And this is something, I mean, this is not a new discussion. I mean, I'm, I'm showing here, you know, Michael, Mike Douglas, 1998, saying we need to go back to the idea, you know, to re-embedding rural policy, urban policy, into some understanding of how, what are these relationships between, Arab, between villages, cities, secondary cities, smaller uh, satellite uh, settlements, etc., etc., uh, through a number of flows. 
I would argue that this type of understanding is very often missing. Yeah? And so when we find what are some of the projects or the taming strategies for these peri-urban areas, very often they are not explicit or they, they are not, uh, yeah, they are not explicit about what are the unexpected consequences with regards to whether they are likely to create reciprocal or truncated linkages with, uh, uh, in terms of these uh, many flows. On the other hand, sorry, <laughs> this approach and this emphasis, this locus of urban policy, re refocusing on urban policy on peri-urban areas, if it is on the one hand too micro, it's also too macro and too abstract to take into full consideration localized practices. Yeah? Everyday practices are usually completely missed by analysis or attempts to somehow tame the metabolism uh, of a city. So when we look at, uh, for instance, policies that are trying to improve a meta the metabolic behavior of the city and so on, we find that the story of not only how food, for instance, uh, flows within the city, but who grows it, with what consequences, are they man, men, are they women, and so on, gets completely lost. And this is also quite problematic. No? So we have an issue with the scales, yeah? an inability as well with the uh, scales that we need to tackle. Now, the third concession, and I get into the case studies, um, has to do with the fact that if on the one hand we are seeing and we are witnessing an increasing normalization of the idea that we have to pursue some form of sustainability through cities and through peri-urban areas, what I think that we are witnessing is the idea that uh, these urban transitions are being pursued but by normalizing the production and reproduction of differential sustainability. What do I mean by that? We are pursuing sustainability, the achievement of the improvement of certain thresholds of environmental performance in certain given territories and for certain social groups at the expenses of others. This is what I call differential sustainability. So this is quite problematic because that means that the policies that we are talking about are presenting quite an important divorce between the notion of environmental justice or any attempt yeah, to, to move towards more just uh, considerations and the delivery of sustainability. So what we are witnessing is that it is perfectly possible yeah, to improve environmental performance, yeah, to improve sustainability performance, but not necessarily always accompanied with um, uh, environmental justice performance. What I want to do is to very briefly look at um, three, perhaps if we have time, four uh, examples of the, um, some of the very distinct uh, types of uh, policies yeah, that live within this repertoire uh, um, of, uh, of policy narratives. The first one has to do with the idea of curbing urban sprawl and particularly doing that through non-service provision. Let me, I keep on doing this. Um, a long time ago, not a long time ago, early, early 2000s, I, was, I had the, the possibility of uh, working, um, leading a project, a research project, a research project that was looking at how was that the architecture of uh, water governance was being restructured in peri-urban areas of high metropolitan uh, regions uh, in different parts of the world. One of them was Mexico DF. Yeah? Uh, and the intention at the time was the following. The, 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 the concern was that at that time we were coming from a point in which the, the neoliberal mantra, the idea that in fact you know, uh, uh, the governance uh, of water or the way to go about uh, the universalization of some form of water and sanitation provision had to do uh, with uh, 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 the, the privatization of services was starting to be heavily criticized and you could see an explosion of different options. So what we wanted to do in this project was two things. On the one hand, we explored what was that these uh, policy makers in these five different cities were thinking in terms of the new direction. What was seen, what was deemed as desirable in terms of the new direction that should we pursue to rearticulate the governance of water and sanitation. Um, and on the other hand, we also went to the ground. We went to the ground and saw also what were people in peri-urban areas that is in context of uh, uh, urbanization without infrastructure doing to get by yeah, when they were uh, outside this hypothesis. And what I show here, the, the water wheel and, and, the, and over time uh, was followed by many more wheels, shows a sort of a schematic representation of what we found in the different cases. What we could see was that the sort of the spectrum of options 
yeah, that were considered or evaluated yeah, as possible means towards desirable change were completely different. What was considered in terms of policy-driven strategies was completely different from what people were doing, and there was no connection at all between the two. Yeah? So this is, I mean, obviously uh, quite problematic, but quite systematic. We found this exactly in all the areas. Now, when we try to engage, um, say, for instance, I don't know, in any of the areas, we would find, of course, as you would expect, that informal sector vendors would represent a very important lifeline yeah, for the, the actual access of peri-urban dwellers uh, to uh, water, but also sanitation. When we would go to this sphere and say, well, okay, what is the plan with regards to that? The plan would always be uh, uh, inexorably, well, there's no plan, they shouldn't exist, that shouldn't be part of reality and so on. So this is what I mean about this idea of taming, yeah? taming, regulating, domesticating, ignoring, excluding. And these tensions with, with regards to what is to be included and what is to be excluded uh, are, um, um, are something to be noticed. Now, what, was, what became very clear, um, clear very quickly in the case of uh, Mexico, uh, metropolitan Mexico, was also that, in fact, what was regulating the architecture of water and sanitation governance had nothing to do with uh, the possibility of extending services, per se, but had much more to do with uh, a completely different policy. Policies that were seeking to use non-service provision as a policy, as a means to curb informal growth. And this is quite an interesting case study, which is not a one-off. This is why I'm bringing it. What I can see is that uh, we find that for decades, the idea of some form of compact city development, smart growth, and so on, urban containment policies have been very popular in the global north for a long time. This idea of we need to preserve uh, uh, certain um, uh, uh, areas of land, you know, from development, etc., for you know, dedicated purposes. This is something that, of course, you know, is underpins the very notion even of a green belt. Now, what we find from the 80s onwards is that this idea of urban containment policies start to move into new geographies, start to become really popularized in the context of the global south, but also into new objectives. And one of the favorite targets you know, of, of this urban con uh, um, containment policies becomes the idea of using them to curb informal growth. Yeah, to curve not urban sprawl in general, but the, informal, the uh, uh, urban sprawl that is associated with informality. Yeah? So a very punitive way of looking at uh, certain processes taking place in the periphery. This type of policies also mark the end of some relationship of tolerance, neglectful tolerance, yeah? with the spread of uh, 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 informa, uh, informal settlements and informality uh, in, in peri-urban areas. Now, how does this work? In the case of Milpalta, for instance, and again, you will find many versions, and in India, I have found some as well, um, this works through the idea of zero growth paths, sometimes called border paths and so on. How does this work in practice? Well, uh, the case that I'm looking at landed in the most rural, the, uh, the most rural district within uh, metro, the metropolitan region of, um, of uh, uh, Mexico DF. The idea being here that, in fact, this being Milpalta being the most rural uh, district within Mexico DF, uh, it was extraordinarily important to preserve the dwindling aquifers, you know, and, and an area, an important area for aquifers recharge that was uh, um, contained there. This area, at the same time, since the NAFTA agreement, is an area, a forested area, uh, with very low density, uh, which had been undermined since the NAFTA agreement. You know, hidden and communal lands have been uh, typically undermined, and it started, of course, you know, just to shift. You know, the, we witness here, like in many peri-urban uh, areas, we witness here a gradual process of a slow land conversion, yeah, where we see the subdivision of land, the pirate, no, what is called the pirate subdivision of land, informal transactions and so on, giving place to some form, you know, of a, a housing, some form of a, a, a access to land to those who were absolutely squeezed out of any other a, land and housing markets within Mexico City. Now, what we see here is the idea that the zero growth pact then is conceived with the idea that the resources, 
yeah, the resources, the aquifers, and the capacity of these forests yeah, to recharge uh, to, um, uh, the aquifers that are uh, uh, supplying drinking water or guaranteeing the supplies of drinking water, a part of them, to Mexico City, um, have to be protected at any cost. And the non-service non provision is used as one element. The Zero Growth Pact does the following, establishes census, so in this case, for instance, the census was done in 1997, and the Zero Growth Pact basically tries to establish a limit date, in which it says, well, okay, whoever is settled until now will get some form of water. The type of water that they will get will never be network. Yeah? There will never be pipe water. This is one of the important elements that has to be, informality has to be disciplined. Yeah? Even if tolerated, it has to be disciplined in this case. So this is, is done in this way. Yeah? People who are within the zero growth pact will get one of these tanks of water or pipas once a week, depending on the size of a family and so on. But in exchange, in order to keep that entitlement, a very precarious entitlement, they have to police the area. And they have to denounce anybody who settles after 1997. What happens to those who settle after 1997? They are not entitled to any water at all. Of course, an impossible situation. Yeah? So what we find here is one of the forms in which I, I mean, what, what I describe as the, uh, the, the production and reproduction of differential sustainability, here establishes an arbitrary date by which people have a very, um, a, a very weak entitlement or no entitlement at all. Yeah? With, uh, of course, uh, uh, with, with, with Now, what is interesting here is that um, what, what we can see in the story is that, of course, you know, the zero growth pathway was quite ineffective, you know, to, to regulate or to stop, uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, land conversion in the area. Um, people agreed to it, and in fact, it was, you know, superseded by a number of uh, practices, everyday practices, like, for instance, bribing the guy who can the trunk track that will come with water, uh, very localized uh, political clientelistic practices where the local or the municipal district mayor would agree or expand, you know, those that enter the, uh, the zero growth pack and so on uh, in exchange of votes and so on. So you could find all the repertoire of things that also do policy, yeah, um, and, and distort that. But what is more interesting here is the fact that when we look at zero policies like zero growth tax or any other form of urban containment policy, we see, we see two sides of urban policy really making noise and not talking to each other. On the one hand, the problem that environmental regulation in this case and an attempt yeah, to enforce some form Thank you. 
In this case, the idea of paying for ecosystem services. Yeah. Exactly the same principle, land in the same territory, the idea that what we have to do, what happened before, was that we got implementation work. Yeah. Implementation didn't work, it was a, 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 the policy was okay, but it was distorted by, a, a, by a corruption, <coughs> and so on. Uh, paying for ecosystem services became then seen as a new panacea. And by 2008, in fact, uh, Mexico had one, if not the largest, payment for ecosystem services program applied to urban areas. What is interesting in this case, and I will say only a couple of things to move to other examples, is that how does this work? The idea of paying for ecosystem services is rapidly, first of all, it's rapidly popularized, being popularized and shifted not only from being very popular in, our, in rural areas, but becoming a new becoming a, a part of the repertoire or the strategies applied um, in urban policies. Uh, the principle is, is, uh, is very simple. The idea that what payment for ecosystem services do, whether they are applied to the sequestration of carbon uh, dioxide or any other properties, is you couple urban water, in this case urban water service charges, with positive environmental externalities supplied in this case by very urban forests. Uh, so the idea, in short, is in this case that water, urban water, uh, those who that consume urban water uh, in, uh, in cities should be paying somehow for the external, the positive, you know, the externality uh, of, um, uh, of those that are preserving rather than deforesting uh, forested areas. Now what is interesting in most cases is that again, there is a long history to be told here, we don't have the time to go through it today, but the payment for ecosystem service policies started with very strong anti-poverty uh, uh, credentials. Yeah? So the idea was very much that these policies, in fact, should be, uh, should be uh, particularly affecting those areas or being implemented in those areas that were uh, far uh, marginal, lacking resources, and so on. Now, in the design and in the implementation, in the detailed design of the policy, what we find is that some of these, most of these pro, uh, poor prevention started to be um, uh, abandoned. And one of the considerations was that, in fact, it was very difficult to create markets in which water consumers could pick up the bill to uh, create enough incentives for land not to be, uh, for land not to be converted into, um, uh, uh, into uh, informal settlements, was difficult to do that far away from cities. So again, you know, payment for ecosystem services started to land in Milpalt, uh, near areas, where in fact there was very little forested land, yeah? But the idea that there was some possibility for the market mechanism to work. I'm going to move quickly. The next one. Now, moving now to Lima, uh, another city where I have been working for the last four years and where I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working quite much at the moment, um, we see another important, another very interesting and typical uh, narrative of this repertoire uh, of policies, which has to do with this idea of unleashing the dead capital of a poor to land cycling. We are all familiar with this idea, yeah, Armando de Soto, the mystery of capital, financial studies uh, coming, and we'll come back to it, but basically putting forward the proposition that in fact there is a dead capital yeah, in the organization of the poor that could be unleashed only if we were to convert, yeah, to, uh, to, to provide them with land cycling. Uh, that would then give them access to, to, to mortgage credits, etc. Et you, know, you know the whole, the argument of the social. Now, I'm bringing this into consideration because Lima uh, was, is not only the home of the social and of his organization, uh, the Institute for Liberty and Democracy, but also has been the first site where land titling a la de Soto uh, has been, uh, 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 has been uh, 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 experimenting with at, at scale. Through the state, with the state, uh, through the SOTOS uh, Foundation, and with a lot of external support. So Lima has been very much the unity of uh, land hygiene and trying this idea of whether it can really, uh, can we really unleash debt capital 
uh, through land title. What is interesting here is that, again, it will work to us, but what are we trying to tame? What, is, what are these policies trying to tame? What we are can see here is that what is not to be tamed is uh, capitalist urbanization, rather the opposite. Yeah? So again, we can see that the relationship between what is seen as desirable and undesirable uh, uh, is quite different. Now, a couple of a few considerations um, about Lima. I've bring some maps to show you, again, we could have done the same with, with uh, Mexico, but look at what happened in the case of Lima. Lima is the second, I mean, a small city for Indian standards, about 7 million people uh, at the moment, uh, including the metropolitan area, quite large uh, 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 for Peru and, 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 and considerably large uh, for Latin America. Now, what is interesting to see is that this is the second, despite its, its size, is the second driest, largest metropolis of the world, yeah, after Cairo. So we have Cairo and then Lima. A city that is developing yeah, under extreme conditions, yeah, and under a very extreme or diffi difficult dialogue with its own um, ecological infrastructure. What we see between 1957 and 1981 is an explosion of areas, an explosion of informal settlements. And there is a long history behind what was happening there, but what we see as well is a massive process of migration as well, very much oriented not only for the attraction of uh, the economic activities offered by Lima, which is still the primary city that concentrates and dominates, produces more than 50% of the GDP uh, of Peru, but also of people being displaced through the activity uh, of uh, the, the civil war uh, and the activity of shining path and so on. Now, by 1981, we had about 32% of the population living in this informal settlement. Yeah? And with some areas starting to, this, these are the, the slopes, these are the hills, these are the seas. Now, by 2004, we see a completely different map. The areas in red are the uh, informal settlements. Yeah? We see a huge expansion of informal settlements. Yeah? And 60%, almost 60% of the population living in those informal settlements. What is interesting to see is that we look at what happened demographically there. In fact, you know, the, 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 the rates of uh, population growth uh, started to decline quite systematically yeah, in, in that period. What we have here is not necessarily a process that is generated by any form of demographic shift, Nec definitely not connected to significant uh, migration flows, but much more to do with the point in which Lima and Central Lima starts to expel the poor. There is no way you can escape within the city. Yeah? Uh, you cannot access the market. And so we start seeing this axis yeah, of development building the city into, again, the city to be. Yeah? The city, the Lima to be, uh, uh, being built uh, into the slope, which I will show you in a second. Now, what is interesting is that uh, very often when you show this map to anybody, people say, oh, yes, you can see here, this is typically the outcome of, particularly here, of the lack of policy, the lack of urban policy, the lack of planning. Well, actually, that's not the case, because what you have in Lima uh, up to the 80s uh, was a very different type of process, a very different type of policy narrative, quite associated with this idea of supporting incremental urbanism. What you had was what was called urbanismo popular autogestionario, the idea that, in fact, the state was not just to tolerate processes of encroachment, invasion, and so on, but collective invasions were to be supported by the state. So that uh, grids you know, and settlements could organize in these systems where then services could be provided, uh, there could be uh, mobility, etc., etc. So there is whole engineering yeah, developed over 15 years that produces a large part of Lima, that houses a large number of people with processes which are very much uh, uh, self-managed but not alone, yeah? co-produced to a large extent, with a large participation of the state. Uh, and very uh, important elements of uh, social organization. Now, by the 90s the story uh, was quite different, you know? and, and again, you, you know the big headlines about what happened in Peru, so, uh, we find a very different story, the end of history, Fujimori, yeah, a, a huge U-turn into um, the way in which this type of process or this type of policies favoring some form of incremental urbanism are being viewed, and a, a much more uh, a typical repertoire of you know, developing the city through large infrastructure development, 
uh, with very corporate, uh, highly uh, corporate um, uh, interventions and so on. What is interesting is that when we look at you know, a city like Lima, a city that has been very much shaped by policies that have been talking or um, uh, legitimized uh, uh, on the basis of talking about the scarcity. The life, the history of Lima and its relationship with urban policy is always connected with some form of scarcity. Not necessarily of creative scarcity, but always, we always will hear people talking about water scarcity, land scarcity, and so on. Um, what is interesting here is that Fushimori uh, in the nineties tried as well, like you know, like it was happening all over Latin America, to privatize the public, the public, uh, uh, the public uh, uh, water and sanitation company, couldn't touch it, and eventually um, uh, Alan Garcia, who uh, succeeded him, uh, politically exploited this with a new turn into this idea of you know uh, of a new generation of policy of water for all. Uh, Alan Garcia popularized this idea of water for all. We need to uh, guarantee that cities will have universal provision. And he further work, you know, this the slogan was at the time, without water there is no democracy. People are fantastic how look at this. Someone told me, well, we live outside water provision, then perhaps we live also outside democracy. Someone else told me, we only have water between 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning, so probably you know, we, we have democracy also only at that time, and so on. The result is, I mean, uh, here you have a huge central, uh, a very important, very resource, very well uh, resource uh, um, uh, water and sanitation company that, uh, uh, that uh, is still fails to provide for 100% uh, of the population. Over a third, percent, uh, a third of the population live with very precarious means of access to water and sanitation, uh, administration sanitation to the world. Now, let's go back to the idea of land sizing, because I started with that and you might be thinking well, what does it all have to do then with land sizing. What is interesting is that, again, I mean, as I, I mentioned before, no, there was this idea of the, the idea, this quite simplistic principle, no? the idea that in fact uh, if we just manage to secure and clearly define property rights, yeah, we will unleash a number of benefits. So these uh, benefits uh, uh, to be unleashed have to do with livelihood opportunities, again, access to credit, access to uh, better access to services, and so on. The uh, Soto was extraordinarily uh, uh, influential with this argument, and this argument is still very much alive yeah, in many parts of the world, and creating and producing uh, uh, policies and uh, policies throughout. One of the reasons this is interesting as well, to sometimes measure and try to understand why, what explains the success of certain policies or certain narratives, and you know, and, and, and the lack of success of others. And I think that a sort of the indicator usually is the simpler and the more automatic, yeah? the more direct the correlation is promised. That seems to be, you know, A will be to, to B, definitely is a winning number. Now, of course, now we have uh, quite a lot of um, analysis. There have been a lot, that, uh, many of my colleagues as well have been uh, following the effects of land titling a la de Soto all over, not only in Lima, but all over Latin America. And there have been many criticisms. I mean, one of them has again to do with the sort of cost or implementation uh, challenges associated to, um, uh, to uh, land titling at scale. Uh, Alain uh, Durand Lazare said, well, if we take, for instance, a fairly typical city of 6 million in which 50% of the population uh, lives in a regular settlement, it will take, uh, you, you need to have the resources for the administration to issue 400 titles per working day for 10 years to the move of that so okay, not very feasible. Uh, in Lima, this wasn't the case. Lima managed to la uh, title yeah, in Lima Cofopri, uh, the national uh, authority in charge of land title, managed to, uh, program, sorry, uh, managed to uh, issue over 200,000 titles yeah, just in Lima in one year. Yeah? So a record. Yeah? So the, we can say that the SOTO's hypothesis here was tested at scale. And what is interesting is that when you look at what happened in all the cases, different studies show the same thing. The correlation didn't work. Yeah? 
people, in some cases, those that became owners, uh, increased some level of investment, but rarely yeah, access different sources of finance. Look at this. Only, yeah, one of the most comprehensive studies shows that only about 20% of those that received land titles through this operation had access to some kind of financing, external financing, that is not their own savings by 2000. Uh, and two. And when I'm talking about this kind of financing, it's state financing. That means only that they became eligible yeah, for state programs. Not at all. Yeah, they, they were not touched at all by any form of uh, private finance. Um, the same, again, the same type of argument and, uh, and evidence can be find, found in, in many other cities, in Bogota, in, uh, in many, many other cases uh, across Latin America. Um, it's still the SOTOS idea, it's still very popular, and in fact last week um, uh, the Minister of Housing of, um, uh, of Peru announced a new generation of land titling policies, but in this case with a new narrative. The idea is that land titling at the head will have to be done in order to reduce urban risk, in order to ensure that people don't live in unsafe locations. Yeah? So again, the interesting thing here is looking at how the narrative and the justification for exactly the same type of policy has changed completely. Uh, now, what land titling did in reality were a number of things. One was it exacerbated definitely the vulnerabilities that were to market evictions, we know why. Um, it also created uh, or stimulated the so-called titling gold rush. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. Speaking to another settler uh, in the periphery of Lima, he, he explained why is that land titling uh, accelerated uh, the, uh, this rush to capitalize uh, 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 lands as something that he defined the urbanization of hope. He said, look at, looking at this territory, what we see is a territory which is the outcome of the urbanization of hope. What do I mean by that? Urbanization of the whole, that if you encroach or somehow access a slope, yes, but it's just in my case, if you talk like this, so you will pay some money to access that, you will flatten it, and eventually, over the time, you might manage to put a shack, and eventually, over the time, you might manage to get some form of very precarious form of access to water and sanitation, that will be nothing uh, network. And eventually, perhaps one time, one day, you are going to have, you know, we have the presence of land titling, which has already happened. At that point, when you get your land titling, you can, you might have the possibility of leap probe. This is your only chance. Yeah? And so, in a way, what created was a very speculative view as well as to what can land titling do. Yeah? This idea that, in fact, if we keep on encroaching on the slope, you know, eventually we'll be reached by another amnesty and another way of land titling, and we might be able to actually uh, uh, unleash uh, uh, the, the, the capital of the world. Now, a further explanation of how the organization of hope works, yeah, according to Eddie, who is, is, is my interviewer here, says this territory is done by four. It's done, of course, by land titling, by cofopri, by all this you know, uh, uh, machinery of uh, uh, policy making and policy implementation organizations, but it's also done by others, by others in the field. And this is something that I, I think is very important to understand. Who else yeah, is participating in the actual implementation, in the actual production and construction of the system? One is what they describe, what he described, and describes as the old settler, people like himself, someone who arrived in the States in 2001 outside the waves, outside the time in which the state was still supporting or endorsing the encroachment of land. So he mimicked, no? he described that process saying, we still mimicked the idea. We came collectively overnight, took over, encroached the land, realized that the state wasn't going to evict us, neither was going to support us, we were on our own. Yeah? So this idea of the old settler yeah, is someone who still believes in a level of collective organization, the right and the social function of the land. And this is very important. How the settlement grows and how the settlement grows over time at the beginning are very much associated with this idea. Whoever needs the land, whoever has for instance high dependency ratio and so on, will, you know, will be given the right to become part of the community and so on. And this is how usually you see the first years. Uh, now, 
These people managed to knock doors, knock doors, and eventually, for instance, what you see is that they all settlers typically will have some form, not of completely network, but some form of water and sanitation, uh, and some form of uh, relations with different public and private institutions. And then there is a newcomer. The newcomer are those who are coming today, yesterday, we come tomorrow. I go uh, many times over the year uh, to Lima, and I can see the changes every three months. Yeah. Every three months, this territory has changed completely. What was before a slow is, you know, the habitat of a very large number of families. Usually, female, uh, single, uh, headed, uh, female-headed households with uh, high dependency ratios. The newcomer is that that is typically not coming from outside Lima. It's typically those families that are squeezed out of other parts of Lima. Most of the newcomers are tenants. Tenants who cannot afford anymore uh, their rents in the core area of the city and have no option but to settle yeah, for this type of organization. Now there is a tourist. The tourist is the guy that really goes into the area of the software. The tourist is the fund of the slope. So the tourist is the center at the bottom part of the slope who is hoping that by entering, yeah, by putting some savings into this process, paying some money, putting a shack and so on, eventually yeah, this land might be, you know, might, might produce some form of savings that might turn into the possibility of sending someone else, someone else to school and so on. The no vive turista, this is very interesting, this is one of the mechanisms by which people try to spot these forms of speculation. Now, not everybody who is described here as a tourist is a tourist. Yeah? What I found on the ground was that very often the idea is that you got a plot and in six months you should be living there. Yeah? You should have flattened it, yeah? you should have somehow condition it in order to be able to live there. If you're a single man, you have two or three kids on your own and so on, you can possibly do that yeah, in, in six months. And many of these described tourists are in fact the most vulnerable in the chain. The people who lose all the work that they have done and start again to try to So, a lot of planning here again, no? It's like, I mean, I always find when people say, no, there is no planning, the amount of planning, the amount of everyday planning that you find in the state is huge. You have to plan for absolutely everything. This is a typical landscape that you will see here. These are the staircases. Yeah? These are the staircases painted, yeah, painted with the Peruvian, in this case, the Peruvian uh, uh, flag. And these, uh, these uh, were funded, the concrete, these are made by the people. The concrete, in this case, is, uh, was given by the actual mayor. And of course, the only thing that he has change is to have this you know, fantastic you know, campaign of having you know the colors of his party painted all over the city. Um, now what we find here is um, these stars to heaven articulating a number of processes yeah, which have been very much connected with uh, this uh, process of land cycling and this triggering that there is a possibility of um, uh, in this process of urbanization of home. On the one hand, this type of occupation is happening not only on uh, highly risky areas, but also on areas that are uh, called Loma Costeras. This is a very unique uh, ecosystem that performs a number of very important functions uh, within, the, uh, within Lima, from uh, preserving, uh, regulating the microclimate, preserving, uh, 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 reducing runoff, preserving uh, uh, the possibility of capturing, recharging the aquifers and so on. On the one hand, so we have a re-evaluation and a reappraisal of the value of this uh, type of landscape. We have random land trafficking and we have two different processes, which is important and I think that this is again something typical. We find it more, I mean, I think it's very, very important to differentiate between the different types of speculation, yeah? a speculative practices, speculative planning, everyday planning that takes place on the ground. In this case, we found on the one hand the sort of process of pirate land subdivision that is done by the by the settlers. Yeah? The idea, I mean, they usually say, well, we have we know that we have no support. The only source, the only source uh, to collect some further funding in order to invest, in order, for instance, to develop some improvements in terms of sanitation, uh, in, 
hand mobility and so on, is by subdividing more flows. Okay? So there is a very perverse logic by which the first settlers will of course you know, just keep on uh, propelling yeah, this uh, uh, endless pilot land subdivision. On the other hand, there is another process which is very important that has to do with actual mafia, land mafia, land trafficking mafia, clash, organized, with lots of corruption, connections with the government and so on, opening the roads yeah, from the top of its load. So you have these two processes meeting uh, each other and creating vicious cycles of risk, externalization and, and internalization. Just to show you one case, yeah, this idea of, you know, again, interesting to see how collective every day planning, in this case collective work under some form of ne neglected problems. Yeah? The idea is well, we don't have policies for the housing, we don't have uh, land policies, so you know, let it be. This is more or less, you know, let it be for a while and at some point and it's set up with episodes of eviction. Look at this. This is what people, yeah, we, we have been mapping this year after year with the people uh, who live in in this area, and this shows different years of settlements, 2004, 2008, 2012, yeah, the different colors. But what is more interesting, and this is the so-called perimeter. This is the area that they manage, this is a map that is certified, the area that they manage to claim as some form of, uh, to be some form of precarious entitlement. Once you have a map that is certified, you have a clock that has a number, you have a certificate of possession, that means that you might be eligible to some form of water connection. Yeah, or, and, and perhaps in the future, uh, if there is another way of plantizing some form of plantizing. Now, what people do is this. I don't know if you can see it very, very clearly. But we, when we ask every year and we say, show us the latest map we have produced, the latest map they produce is plot all the way yeah, to the top of the field. And again, this is very much fighting different. The logic is trying to see, no? On the one hand, is to av avoid land traffickers from taking over the same territory first. Um, another very important argument that people give is the idea of to reach a critical mass. They say, if we are 20, 25, 30, 50 families, we will never get to the public here. We need to reach at least 120, 200 yeah, families. So we need to reach a critical mass. And this idea of reaching a critical mass keeps on reproducing further slow. And of course, as I mentioned before, this idea of also of generating local funds to support further improvement. So again, a very uh, perverse logic. This is the sort of, uh, this is what we did with people, what we were looking at, okay, what was that, what is that, they, what they regard as a perimeter, what, what are their plans for urbanizing? Yeah? So who are the urbanizers here? Who is shaping, um, who is shaping the city? Now, in this case, like in the case of the water, uh, the water uh, wheel, we are also building with the people in risk groups and trying again to understand. In this case, I mean, these are territories where you know risk uh, is, 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 is everywhere. Interesting again to see that when we look at the re repertoire of state-led risk mitigating practices and policies, a complete disconnection with the type of risk that we find here. What we find here is that people are being killed, injured, they are losing property, not because of earthquakes and so on, not because of the repertoire of large scale disasters that are being uh, addressed or contemplated here, but very much because of everyday risk and episodes of risk that have to do with landslides, dog slides, um, gastrointestinal, respiratory diseases, and so on. Uh, again, very, very little uh, connection and dialogue between these policies and the amount of money invested here and these practices and the amount of money invested there. Um, to, to start with happy, uh, what we see in a way is, um, is probably that we are, we are trapped, I would say, you know, probably, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this kind of uncertainty, we could say that, that um, um, Sean Turner was quite right when he described one of the syndromes. He described this in 1907, saying that the drama of the planner and say, the policy maker is that of divided vision. We live in a time of paradigm change, we live in a time of extreme uncertainty, and what we see increasingly, in this case, you could see between, for instance, uh, the area of policy design and policy implementation, is a divided vision where 
people can either only recognize or relate to universal principles, yeah, theories, assumptions, other historical, or yeah, with the idea of unique conditions of application, but losing the connection between the two. And this is very important. What I try to say here is that one, perhaps, of the key uh, considerations to take into account is the need to stop perhaps separating uh, the analysis of urban policy design and urban policy implementation as if there were two different things. Is there any policy without implementation? Of course not. So we, we need to, I think that it's very much starting to link how is that, you know, how is that the conception of a policy, the implementation of a policy in a particular political economy yeah, helps us to understand and explain what is changing, what is not, why something is working or not. Now, John Sander also argued for something quite interesting which I think can be brought um, um, into consideration as, as, a, um, as another way of thinking about how to reframe uh, urban policy practice. Uh, he said, another typical, he was talking about planning, again, but I think that this applies very much to, 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 to policy making. Another typical problem is that if we look at the way in which we uh, intervene upon reality as planners or as policy makers, at best we have, so we have a given situation, we arrive at an action, decide the, all the action, the acts, and then look at the impact. And at best we might have some form of reflective practice. That means we might have some form of learning, policy learning. This is, we're very weak on that. We're extraordinarily weak on policy learning. I mean, I mentioned before uh, land cycling, you know, the sort of made so much noise that we had a whole generation of researchers, you know, following and looking and measuring exactly whether he was right or not. But this is not very common. Yeah? There are very few policies where you can say yeah, that there has been a creation of evidence to see what happened. Did that work or didn't it work? We move from one set of assumptions into another one. This is usually how policies replace each other. We are very, very weak in terms of creating some form of reflective practices that draws upon previous lessons to inform current uh, policy making. And this is definitely uh, a problem, yeah? a very weak experience feedback. But some might say probably that experience feedback is not enough. Because by the time we learn something didn't work and why it didn't work, probably the situation, the conditions have changed again. And, and we would always be, you know, the, the future looking, uh, the forward looking uh, policies that policy should uh, have would be undermined. So he talks and recommends very much the idea of thinking or trying to approach policy and planning as a reflexive practice. That's, that's trying to systematically uncover what are the embodied categories, what are the embodied assumptions, yeah? uh, where are they flawed, yeah? what, again, what type of change is desired, what is to be paid, uh, why is it desirable, why is not. Um, what I have tried to do before was, and this is something that I try to do whenever I land some, somewhere, and I try to make sense of what is happening here, what are people saying, what are people doing, what are people doing in different organizations, what are people doing on the ground. I try to systematically ask the same questions. And these questions have to do with interrogating institutional practices and, of course, interrogating everyday practices, the sort of practices that I was talking about before, whether connected with large trafficking mafias or everyday uh, you know, uh, land pirate subdivision. But interrogating them for a number of things. I think that not romanticizing them for you to do everyday practice is extraordinarily important. We need to understand these institutional practices, policies, and what people do on the ground for what they say and for what they do. And we also need to understand what, what they say, how they say, it, and so on, has very different forms, very different forms of knowledge, very different forms of talking and intervention of reality. This is why talk about recognizing the abstract and normative ways of knowing and talking about reality that we find about policy makers, and how do we interrogate them? They're very different from the interrogation of the very contextualized ways of knowing and talking about reality that people, yeah, uh, that people operate with on the ground. The most important thing to find life, in my view, has to do with the shelter between these institutional practices and these everyday practices. If we were to talk about any policy failure, I would say 
policy failures are usually explained not because there wasn't enough resources, not because there wasn't implementation deficit, not because there wasn't enough money, capacity, and so on. These things, okay, live there. They are part of, of, of any context. But mostly because, on the one hand, there are sometimes important flaws with regards to what is to be changed in the first place, yeah? what is the diagnosis of what is wrong, what is the diagnosis of the sense of direction and change, uh, 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 direction of change that is to be pursued, and also no engagement at all with everyday practice. The everyday practice, again, not to be romanticized, and not just talking about you know, the poor, and talking about very speculative, very cruel, very negative also processes. Yeah? Here is nothing only to be romanticized or uh, celebrated. Um, to finalize, one more thing, if we were to accept this idea that in fact good policies, if we are to have something like good urban policies, are likely to be born out of this chunter between everyday and institutional practices, we need to also pay attention to a number of things. One of them has to do with this idea of the change in architecture of policy. I haven't talked a lot about that, but there is a lot to think about that. Who does policy? We attend a completely different scenario. Policy making is not in the same hands that it was 20 years ago, whether in India, in Latin America, in any, in any country in Africa. The architects of policy are changing dramatically, and particularly when we talk about urban policies connected with the idea of smart, green cities, and so on. We find a hegemonic patterns of policy mobility, yeah? so there can be, of course, there, are, there can be many benefits on policy mobility, but the way in which ideas and policy ideas are traveling is not uh, devoid of certain uh, powers and very corporate behaviors. Yeah? So, of course, we find the Arabs, the Atkins, the, you know, the, the whole uh, set of 10 to 12 the big, large uh, companies, corporations, very much being very, very instrumental in the dissemination, the diffusion of certain ideas that become very, you know, travel from, again, Milpalta to Chennai and so on in a very short uh, period of time. Um, so we need to watch this, yeah? and particularly this increased emulation of some preferred universal solutions. Yeah? This, is, this is extraordinarily important. Um, a second important thing is the idea of time. Remember that before I said we have a problem with this very uh, weak learning on, on, on the implementation of policies. Did it work? Did it work? Why and so on? Uh, and the only way, the only way to improve that learning, policy learning process, is to look at course of change throughout time, but in a very long term trajectory. We need to have more patience. Okay? We talk sometimes about policy change in, in time frames that are impossible. Uh, I am particularly a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment has precisely to uh, is connected with this idea of capturing long term trajectories of change over time. This is not just for, for instance, to see how was that people walk out of urban water poverty? But what I'm interested to see is, did they all work out of urban water poverty? Did they fall into water poverty again, and so on? So we need to, again, disaggregate these realities, yeah? this, what happens to different groups, yeah? whether it's to do with food security, risk traps, climate change, vulnerability, and so on. What happens to people over time, and what happens to specific groups over time? And for what reasons do they walk in and out of uh, it, uh, the type of change that was, um, uh, was pursued. I talked before about the issue of scale, when I was talking about the, 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 the two macro, the two micro syndrome, and we have an issue there. Some uh, generations of policies are far too abstract. They, they cannot recognize, they cannot read the ground, they cannot read, uh, and, and they are, they are uh, doomed to fail. And a very important final aspect, and I finish here, is the issue of the space. I find it quite surprising how aspatial urban policy is and how aspatial the analysis of urban policy is. Uh, we, I mean, we are talking about the space. Things happen, yeah? we are talking about desirable change that should affect certain groups, but has a word. And the discussion of that word is very, very limited. At most, we might have a map, you know, but a map that is not interrogated, that is not critically questioned, and so on. So, the idea of using a space as a lens of interrogation, facial interrogation of policy, is an essential element of work. <coughs> but sometimes there is a lot of why is that something quite likely to work or not to work, to work at the right scale or not. Um, and just to finish here, 
and bringing us back to the notion of practice, um, I think it's basically important it's because it's also the word shakti of Pavoni we um, I stop here so we can have fun. Thank you. Questions, comments? Thanks, Adriana. Lovely again hearing you after a long time. Uh, there's much here which will take time to digest. And a lot of what you said is stuff that we all as researchers, as, as people who work in the urban, uh, mull over. And very rarely do we get encapsulated in, in 20 slides. So thanks for that. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, I mean, the whole question of um, the environmental trajectory, the environmental movement changing from the just environmental justice framework towards a kind of capitalist environmentalism of sorts happened towards around the mid 90s at least and and now with the with the overall frame assuming increasingly proportions of risk so questions of security in various forms uh, risk also defined in various forms but largely that there is some uh, there is an anthropocene moment and so on so this whole question of taming taming the urban taming the environment etc Gradually, it almost appears as if the environmental movement itself is getting co-opted into into these forces of 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 uh, um, of systematizing um, change in some ways. Uh, smart cities is just one of them, and I'm just wondering how you feel about this, uh, because also it's 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 worth learning from the experiences of South America, but there are also places where organization is is has a history. It's very dense, I mean, 80, 70% or 80% of, of Mexico, Brazil are urbanized. Uh, whereas in India, it's 31%. So the political kind of outpouring of an environmental democratic kind of movement, whether it's water, whether it's, you know, you name it, uh, hasn't really happened. So usually what the government says, the prevailing government of the day, kind of makes it an either or question and says, poverty is the biggest pollutant, you know, you know that, that, that logic. I'm just wondering how you kind of see a way out of this. Um. Question. Um, I think that, I mean, I agree with you, there is definitely a bit something you mentioned. Of course, you know, we have to think about the ecological organization, and, you know, the emergence of this paradigm taking over the idea of making the environment, the political idea of business as usual, but with a very strong, you know, the interventions and so on. And that is a very popular narrative in our way. I don't know if the environmental movement per se has been called to. The environmental questions have been called to, or elements of the other, which I'm not saying. Now, when you look at the environmental movement in any case, um, it, has, it has so many titles, no? Martin Javier speaks about the you know, multiple environmentalism of the poor and so on, and very often people don't align with you know, as anything, uh, uh, I mean, the type of groups that I'm talking about, or the school and work, the movement that try to tell us that, you know, the, environmentalists and probably that doesn't matter. But can they think of the space? Can they think of the environmental consequences? Can they relate to them? Uh, yes, they can. And I think that that is what matters the most. I think that there is, in Latin America, you still find that when you go beyond this more estalized perception of environmental movements, uh, you know, in the style of Friends of the Earth, uh, Green Keys, and so on, uh, you find that there is a very strong mobilization, social mobilization that is bringing up questions that have to do with the social, the environmental, the economic, and so on, all entangled, which is absolutely fine. You know? I mean, I think that this sort of dissecting you know, social mobilization, we are asking what is the question and where does it fit, is not very useful. Um, the question is again, how do you, how do you bring it to the fore? Because there, is, there, there are still many, uh, you find very often this black media. So this idea of you know, people are confronted very often with this idea that we have to publish our priorities. So this is the most immediate. You know, how can we think about the Lomas if I don't have any form of implementation? And these trade-offs are tough. And these, were, these are the elements where we need to find you know, tracks and ways. Is it possible when you are absolutely oppressed you know, to find some engagement in your practices with long-term 
long-term intervention is very difficult, but it is possible. But to find that is quite difficult. I was talking to someone today, I was saying, I find that uh, one catal catalyst for that, that I use a lot, is not. Precisely because of this, you know, emphasis on bringing the head, talking about the world. And I find that the conversation of the, what people establish, what, what is happening, what is desirable, the way in which, for instance, I was showing you those maps, you know, where people are saying, oh, we're going to plot, study by plot, and all the way to the very future. And so then we say, okay, let's, let's walk there, let's look at there, let's map all the areas where you have uh, the possibility for instance, having uh, rock slides and so on. And then they remove them. Yeah. So there is a possibility of really these reconsidering strategies and so on. So people are very, very clever. No, but, but we just need to use the elements uh, to talk about that. My concern is that I think that the, the way in which we, we see the environmental question by ecological modernization arguments that the parties in the sort of narrative and so on entering the urban policy arena is very exclusionary. No, it's absolutely expert based, it's based on modeling, it's like, I mean, who is going to understand the you know, it's, it's, it's quite difficult, you know, to create a sort of, you know, a co-produced policy and co-produced learning that I was talking about. So this is quite problematic as well. It's really a closing, you know, there is, there is a, this is what I was talking about, looking at the architecture of the policy, yeah? and who, who is, who are the policy designers? Whose voices, whose, whose knowledge counts? Who can have a say? Um, actually, my question is related to that. I mean, it's not necessarily related to the rest of your talk, but on this question of who are the architects of policy and sort of the, the, the mobility of ideas, right, and how sort of these large consulting firms are taking over, I think one of the things we're seeing here now is not just in the big ideas, not just in the translation of ideas, but in the day-to-day -day running, management, and planning, and sort of the day-to-day -day practices, you know, these, these sort of private sector players are taking over, right? So it's, it's whether it's implementing a master plan for a city or, you know, running a large infrastructure project coordinating across state governments or across levels of government. It's in the everyday practices and there it's even less identifiable where things are coming from or where levers are sort of moving. And I wonder if you could sort of comment a little bit more on that in the Latin American context or from... I think that it's exactly the same. That's what I was saying. I mean, I think that policy cannot be understood without looking at the whole uh, policy intermediaries that we have. And some lead the institutions that, you know, are have some issues in the issue policy and some outside and we do need to recognize that issue. That issue is extraordinary. The process is, I, I, I brush very quickly, yeah. but it's quite interesting to see how and why something that started with this objective change completely direction in the design was actually, you know, otherwise the market incentive would not be creative and so on. And so we have to use, uh, drop some of the objectives to make it work. Uh, and of course, there are very interesting stories about the political economy of that process of policy making. Mm -hmm. We need to talk to those processes. No? We, need to talk to, we need to see who is making policy. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not just policy making, for sure. Yeah. Um, touching upon both the questions, and uh, actually looking at Maybe the maybe that whole act of uh, working with them to uh, help help them look uh, better look at their plots as you were giving them a visual uh, depiction, uh, if, if that's my correct understanding, uh, with with them. Uh, I have a, a two prong question. One is that uh, can the active participation of planners create that feedback loop, that that sort of reflexive feedback loop, uh, by by giving the uh, the uh, people, the the people who are working with in question, uh, some sort of a visual or tactile representation of where things are going. So uh, one of the questions being, uh, it's also a question of data. Like uh, the, the the reason, especially in our country, why we're not able to adapt to scale at uh, uh, when it comes to services, infrastructure, and even housing, is you don't you don't have that ready-made data. And how do you participate with people at scale at, and at the same time looking at a lot of local concerns? So, will the um, planner who's or, or urban designer working with them, what are your thoughts and how they can intervene and sort of create this sort of reflexive loop and maybe connect the dots or, or present something which policy makers uh, and, and the decision makers sort of come on the same platform? Uh, 
So what is your thoughts on how the planner or the urban design in question can achieve that? Mm -hmm. The data message, no? that's, a, that's a typical the typical narrative, you know, why policy fights and so on. Um, I think, of course, you can go to small forms of self generation that can be mapped, that can be placed, and so on. Uh, the question is, what type of change are we looking for? And you have to be very explicit. I mean, there are the ethics of engagement with that. You know, I, I, I work a lot with, with people on that and so on. But one of, I was mentioning to someone today, one of the first things that we can by doing is Okay, if we're going to map, why are we going to map? What are we going to do? What are all the reasons? And even in the same room, and I want to say we have 100 different reasons. You know, we want them up to make sure that we're the victim. We want them up to this to see how many more clothes we can fit. We want, you know, you have even all these different rationalities, not between policymakers and, and, and you know assessors, but between people. So you really, I mean, you have to go through processes that allows us. As as ordinary citizens, as as policy makers, as as politicians, to be more strategic. And, and, and it's just this you know, iteration of, you know, of being challenged. I mean, it's, you know, being challenged, talking, negotiating, seeing, going back, going forward. For that, I, I was saying, I, I, I have developed a system of using maps and mapping for that, in which I use maps in three different functions. One is the reading of maps. So usually when I go somewhere, I look at all the maps. How is that an area of map? I no, like an interviewer would say, show me the map, show me the map, show me the map. Yeah? I put all those maps and I try to read them. And these are usually very interesting conversations when you start to who maps, who is mapped, what consequences, and so on. The reading of maps. engaged with and so on and also very careful no I mean maps for instance maps can become uh, you know a means for evictions no we have very often the problem of saying you know we, we build these maps and then we have to look at how do we protect who is going to have the code where is this map going to live is someone going to sell this information you know to a land trafficker so I have faced them all yeah in the list and there are risks no, it's dirty. You have to get your hands dirty. Yeah. So you mentioned the architect of policy. Uh, on the ground level, what right. and you said that Then, uh, really have a say when it comes to executing the policy? How many people really executing that policy? And say, when you were you know, who, who is a well, but all, how is the Like, who's, who's the contact person? Who talks? 
Um, this is um, also quite problematic, no? Because of course you have um, uh, self-appointed leaders, you have genuine leaders, you have uh, leaders that represent collective interests, you have those who represent private interests and so on, and, and this is part of that reading. Now when you say who are the stakeholders, I think that again the, the, the problem is um, it depends very much of the type of policy. I mean, in most cases, we're talking about, you know, uh, many of the policies that I described um, uh, are either very coercive with those stakeholders. Is a zero growth pact? I mean, what, what, what is a pact? No, a pact, uh, for instance, uh, presumes the fact that there are two parties, you know, <laughs> agreeing on something, discussing on something, and so on. And this is a completely coercive thing called pact. Uh, in payment for ecosystem services is the same, you know. So uh, there is, I think that there is a very cynical, I hate the stakeholder language, because I think that there is a very instrumental way of sitting people at the table in a very um, selected way, yeah? Um, we, I think that there is uh, clearly a, a, a more and more, the more, the greener we get in terms of the, the repertoire of policies, uh, the more exclusionary also it gets in terms of the who are the stakeholders, who sits, who has a say, who has a channel and so on. People open channels anyway. This is not, you know, the table is not done by just one side. So, you know, we shouldn't underestimate uh, the capacity of different groups to mobilize um, and, and, and get a seat at the table. I'm, I probably have an answer. I don't know if, if, yeah. if there is a, an answer to your question. Uh, thank you for the amazing presentation. Uh, so what I'm hearing also partly in the presentation and more so in the answers later is partly this disconnect between policy and implementation which policy is utilizing to ensure certain outcomes which are not really what the policy claims to be the outcomes. And implementation itself is mostly what's happening on the ground in a very s different, for very different reasons which are having adverse outcomes to what the policy originally is planning to do. Then why do you propose a solution of policy which does not involve policy and implementation together? Like those who make the policy are also the ones who implement it. I mean, essentially, here in time, scale, and space, this, there seems to be again that, that possibility that one will propose and the other will dispose. And there will be again be that interim gap in between where the implementation part again gets lost or the policy again talks to other st stakeholders than those who are involved. No, I, I perhaps I didn't explain myself clearly. No, I think that, again, I think that the distinction between policy design and policy implementation is, is not very productive. It doesn't really exist. We are in policy design, we are thinking about implementation and so on. And of course, you know, like, so of course I believe there are people who sit in different, has different roles, gets different, you know, uh, 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 different debates, different perspectives on what's going on and so on. And you need all these people feeding into the design and so on. Those who are, have some, you know, uh, legitimacy as policy makers or policy implementators and those who don't, even, you know, those who are uh, described as policy uh, recipients. What I meant there about the time was something different. I was talking about time as looking at long-term trajectories. I was talking about the impatience. There is, we, uh, we uh, witness the projectualization of policy. We witness uh, a state in which um, project interventions, the taming of reality is being favored much more through projects than through policies. Policies take long, uh, are, take you know, large bureaucratic machineries, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that is slow and, you know, and, and there is no time. You know, this, is, the, the, this issue has a lot to do with the architecture of policy making. Large corporations, again, the Arabs, the Bureau of Hapol and so on, uh, they don't operate so much with policies. When they are doing policy advice, they are doing project design. Yeah? And, and they are engineering companies. And that's a way in which they see, you know, the means of change and so on are different. So there is a problem there. Now, what I meant about time is much more to see, look, if you take any area, 
any area in Bangalore, any area in Mexico, around any issue, and you say, what has happened with uh, whatever, the, the airport area and, I don't know, land values, you know, how have they changed? What are the hypotheses that have landed in that part of Bangalore, that part of a city? What are the, uh, the policies that have landed there? The first thing that you need to do is to collect, the collection of policies. And you cannot make sense of what what is attributable to what in terms of change unless you look at what has happened over the long period. Because you might have a moment, if I look at what was happening in Lima, by uh, one year after the land title, it looked like, you know, it was fantastic. You know, the land, those uh, uh, new owners were starting to make investments. It was only five years after that that it, was, it became clear that, in fact, they were not accessing any, uh, you know, private credit at all. Uh, you see what I mean? So th you need to look at this process and this hypothesis over a longer period of time. Thank you so much, Adriana. Thank you. Thank you.